Hello, everyone. Um, I have an advantage at work that I like to start early to go home early. So for this instance or whatever, we're going to start right, right on time and try to be as efficient as possible. The formality slides. And now to the slide that represents ourselves. Uh, my name is Dave Gubberud and Rachel Rickert. And we're both partners uh, at Ring and Du Chateau, we also co lead the commissioning department. And we're glad that everybody is here. And as that slide illustrates, that is our commissioning team. Maybe by the end of this meeting, you'll decide who might be what character, but that's for you to all make your own decisions. You know, part of what we like also is to give back. You know, we've all kind of grown up in the industry and we've had those mentors and people that we've learned so much from. And so we like to take opportunities whenever possible to share our knowledge and lessons learned that we've come across and give back as well. So we're really glad to be here and we appreciate the, the wonderful audience that's here. So why are we here? Well, controls can make your, make your head spin. So, you know, we kind of look at this like it's sort of like an, uh, a soap opera, you know, as the pages turn, hence the name of our, of our uh, presentation here. And while commissioning can touch on all aspects of the building, you can kind of think of it similarly to, your, to a body with the skeleton and the organs and everything that you've got going on with your muscular nature. And what we really want to discuss in this case is the brain or controls. So we're going to be what well, we're going to be calling brain surgery. So with some history or whatever, we have to discuss some basics. Um, the first thing is a controls page turn can be done at any time. So we're going to be focusing on it when it starts, at, you know, if we got hired during the construction phase, which happens many times, mm -hmm. the sooner you have this type of page turn, even if it's just with the designer, or if there are trade allies involved or whatever, the better it'll be and it'll just make the construction phase page turn that much easier. Right, and designers, they're all really smart people, but sometimes, you know, they're human as well and we all make our own series of mistakes in life and work. And so we're just kind of there to wrap our arms, help wrap our arms around the team, get everybody together, create awareness of various things and come to common answers and understandings with the right folks in the room. And though we're going to accentuate this or whatever, from the control perspective, they want you to talk to the project manager. Right. We want to kind of move that project manager to side, and we want to go and talk to the doers, the programmers, the people that actually make things work. Right. So obviously having a page turn, that can result in better functional testing, as many of you have probably experienced yourselves. Another thing about a page turn, right, it can get, talk into, you know, alarming graphics and all of that fun stuff, but mm -hmm. again, we're going to focus on the meat and the potatoes on how things work. Right, buildings are becoming smarter, or systems are becoming smarter, and there's a lot of integrations coming. Sometimes we've even said uh, control contractors are becoming more integrators than programmers, it seems, at times. And page turns can almost happen for any type of technical subject, whether or not it's on security and or fire alarm. So a lot of fun stuff. So we like to think of commissioning as we get to sit on the fence between the contractors and the designers. And it's kind of a fun place to be. But uh, we're there, we're looking out for the owner, we're looking out for the owner's best interests. We're really helping everybody's, hopefully everybody's best interests. But you know, Dave will oftentimes say that he'll, you know, like lob something out there and then duck and then come up and peek and see where all the debris landed. But uh, you know, we do get to sit on, the, sit on that fence, but we, it's really important to make sure you're maintaining a good relationship with folks on both sides of the fence. I'm showing an old picture that probably many of us have seen about what commissioning is and what it was in delivery many, many years ago and everyone kind of talking to each other and then that slide led to this one with all the little separations or whatever and all the disjointedness of construction which then led to wonderful commissioning, putting the big encompassing circle to join the gaps or whatever, and just kind of really help pull the team together. And I look at it, it's one of my favorite words to use, is really looking for all those interdependencies, right? Which then that had us come to think that this same little pie chart applies to the building automation industry mm -hmm. because there are so many people that are involved with the controls that who really knows the right person? You know, we have the integrator, we have people that are specialized in chillers. We have, again, the project manager that's really 
just counting the beans and knows how to procure parts. You know, we, we again want to have these right people in the room. Right, and here's just another display of that same chart, essentially, but in another format. So you can see early in the 80s, you maybe were speaking to a couple of people, a handful of people, but now as you progress through time and come through to today, there's a whole series of folks involved on the, on the BAS side of things. So it's really important to talk to that right person. And while the PM usually has a very good handle on you know, the dollars and cents of the project, and sometimes they are very knowledgeable on the control side, and sometimes they're not, but it's really important to get to the right person that you need to talk to in those meetings. We are huge fans of analogies. So what we're talking about here is something that's referred to as technical instructions, oftentimes used on, I, I grabbed a picture there from Google of a military aircraft, but it could be from a jet airliner, it could be you know, sophisticated machine that is uh, making car parts. And those instructions have to be followed A to B to C to D. I think even at breakfast or something today we were talking about or somewhere about you know control sequences four pages long. I was going, oh my God, they're talking about a technical instruction. <laughs> so those are a piece of an aspect that could be part of the controls mm -hmm. sequences. And alternatively, we. Um, you can have like a cookbook or a recipe book and just like grandma's recipe you're adding a pinch of this or a dash of that to get through the nuances and just to get that recipe right where you want it to be so ultimately we like to have sort of a it's a combination of both so it's sort of a technical instruction but the control contractor is allowed to um, make have kind of that creative aspect where he's allowed to make those pinches of this and dashes of that to get the building to operate the way that the designer intended. I mean, every building is different and systems react differently in different, in different buildings. And so working through those nuances and allowing them that freedom to do so is helpful. Perfect Mundo. Right. I like that. So the slide did change or whatever, but the semblance is still there or whatever <laughs> of the sandbox or whatever. I mean, we, we want to play with all the right people in the sandbox, you know, whether or not that's the sometimes multiple control contractors, which, you know, I, I think their product is somewhat more of a commodity, but every entity does things a little bit different. And then as we were already talking, using the word integrators, mm -hmm. right? We have all of the pieces of equipment vendors or whatever that are involved and everyone has to work well together as well as the other, you know, mechanical contractor, engineer, right. owner, and Play nice in the sandbox. In the sandbox. <laughs> So here, who, for a controls page turn meeting, who needs to be invited to the party? Well, first and foremost, the control contractor. And as we keep talking about, um, the right person, right? So the PM will want to be there from the financial side, but really making sure that the programmer, the implementer, that they are there, they're on site, so you can really talk through how you're going to get from A to B to C to D. The owner, of course, needs to be there because that's the whole reason we're being mm -hmm. the commissioning provider is we're out there looking out for their best interest. But there's also an entity from the owner that should also be there. And that would be a facilities team if there is one available for two purposes. If, number one, they could certainly be learning and what's going on you know, with the project that they're going to be future servicing. But just as importantly is having the facilitator, or excuse me, the facilities folks, they both the words sound the same, um, to tell us some insights or whatever, saying, you know, this is actually our preferred set point. These are our schedules or whatever. Mm -hmm. This is how we prefer to do a rotation of different systems or whatever. So they're very valuable to be in, in, and need to be a part of our meeting. Right. Uh, the mechanical engineer. It is really nice when they come to these meetings. It is their design, it's their, it's their design that everybody on the team is working to bring to life. So having them available to answer questions uh, that the control contractor brings up, that we bring up, you know, that the owner brings up, having them in the room is really helpful and beneficial for this meeting. Mechanical contractor, because it is their equipment that we're going to be namely mm -hmm. talking about. They're also generally the holder of the contract of the control contractor. So they're an important cog to be in the meeting. Right. And then going on that, you've got the equipment vendors, which kind of those oftentimes fall under the mechanical contractor as well. So equipment vendors are important because a lot of times this equipment these days is coming with prepackaged factory controls. 
So these, you know, it will be in a meeting and the control contractor will say, I don't do anything. I just give them a set point and an enable. And um, so really having them together in the same room so we don't have finger pointing later on, we can understand how that equipment's really going to operate and the control contractor can give feedback as to how they can really make stuff happen with them. So getting the right people in the room is important. The general contractor should be there, number one, out of courtesy because it's their project. You know, we're underneath their umbrella, so they should be there. Like my little line there or whatever, you know, oftentimes they're bored or whatever, so I kind of throw in a concrete <laughs> admixer joke or whatever, and then they get all excited for about 30 seconds, and then they go asleep. But one thing that we're noticing, and you know, we tease that we live in Wisconsin or whatever, flyover country, that we're seeing more and more generals or whatever actually having you know, MEP coordinators, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody for actually from their firm that actually has an idea of what's going around. So right. those are great companies that, companies that have those are wonderful, so we want to have those people be involved because that helps educate the whole general of what's going on. And they could be a great advocate for the commissioning process as well, especially when they have that MEP coordinator. Um, and then obviously the commissioning provider. So this meeting is a, this is a meeting that should remain in the hands of the commissioning, pro commissioning provider. It should be facilitated by us. And in our case, we like to bring two people to that event. Um, we have one person who's really wrapping their arms around the team, getting into the nitty gritty details and Working, working through the process and while the second person is also involving themselves in that way, but they're also taking the notes and writing down, documenting the comments and the, and the final resolutions. And that would be me with the dunce cap in that picture. Yeah, that it was way back when. <laughs> um, the designer and you know what leads to success or failure. You know, the designers, are they, are they actually using just masters that they have? pulled off the shelf and are they properly editing them or are they actually spending some time and doing a good job vetting on what they're actually wanting to scope with their narratives mm -hmm. of our sequence of operation? You know, have they coordinated with other disciplines within their own office or a secondary office who might be doing that? You know, our fire smoke dampers and the power to those, you know, are those coordinated? People knowing what is happening there. There's also lots of times, you know, a wiring responsibility matrix that could be very helpful with that. Um, who is actually, you know, controlling the devices, right? I mean, they're making decisions and should the specification, the specification needs to be written properly that, you know, a packaged rooftop manufacturer is responsible for this because, you know, typically that rooftop manufacturer, they're just going to be reading their specification section. The odds of them reading 230993 are very unlikely. They're just going to be looking at the schedule, providing the proposal, and then like that joke you made earlier about standing on the fence mm -hmm. and waiting for the dust to settle, then we would see who would be the last person standing. Right. And the last item there, you know, do control engineer or do the engineers, do they have specialists within their own departments and that? Do they have people dedicated to writing sequences? And when they do, that's kind of a nice thing because mm -hmm. that almost provides them another little quality control section between that because they have somebody, you know, writing a sequence pertaining to what somebody else is designing. So I think that's a really good thing for mm -hmm. firms. Right. It's all, this is still me. <laughs> You know, when we practiced this before, we were always looking to our right and not to our left. Um, we look at this and we talked about the technical instructions and the recipe. You know, the performance specification, in our opinion, is very, it's general in nature and matches more that of a recipe. Mm -hmm. You know, we had the definitive, very detailed six, you know, sequence of operation. Again, leaving no stone unturned and explaining things very, very well to the minute detail. Our preference is kind of seeing a hybrid, and then I refer to generic as design build, but sometimes I flip that word around and call it build design mm -hmm. or whatever, which really doesn't say much of anything that we actually have to really leverage on how people are going to be operating the systems. Right. So with everyone being involved on the contractor side, do the control contractors really know how it works? Do they really know how it works? A lot of times when you have a submittal, a control submittal come back from the controls contractor, it's really copy-paste. 
We're, we're not convinced very often that maybe they've even been fully read. So really having an understanding of reading the words, understanding how it's working. The control submittal, I did say like 99% seem to be copy paste. Every once in a while you run into one that appears to have been looked at more closely. So people become niche or niche, depending where are you from or what time, but <laughs> niche, niche experts. And you know, I, we oftentimes use um, analogies like the trees and the forest. Well, you get people who are really good at you know, this tree or that tree or that tree, but having a person who can really understand how all the trees work together and work for the forest is important. And that's kind of the same when it comes to controls. So you, know, you saw the picture before where we have all these niche experts, but we really still need to have an overall understanding of the building, how the systems are operating together. So the project managers are oftentimes managers and may not understand controls. Some do, um, but not always. We've worked with a variety in our, you know, in our experience. But you know, when we have a control contractor who wants to issue an RFI to change a set point, that's always kind of worrisome. So Paris, Paris, France. Or Paris, Illinois. Words matter. And that wasn't the first time that was used today either, about words matter. I know, right? right? We did hear yeah. words matter. There were some common words that we were hearing today, so it's kind of nice. So um, explaining things is a talent. And you know, sometimes we probably all experienced, whether it was with work or family, sending a text or an email can oftentimes give a different result than if you just picked up the phone and had a conversation. Um, sometimes the feeling or the passion or the true intent doesn't come across in the written word at times. So you know, when we have these controls page turns meetings, it's really nice when they are in person. You can you have all the people that you need in one room. So any question or answer that needs to be asked or answered can be done in that one location in that one place with all the right people there to make those those decisions and answer those questions. And if we indicate there, you know, the control or the commissioning provider as ourselves or whatever. We have to be that facilitator and actually create to allow everyone to feel comfortable. This is not in any way, shape, or form an adversarial meeting. Mm -hmm. Even if we might be you know, shaking our head internally in our office about what we might be going into, we have to go there to be create team building or whatever mm -hmm. so that people let their guard down so again we can have a conversation. Because the whole premise, and we're going to use use this word multiple times, is really just to provide awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, the words aren't necessarily being interpreted, but when we use the words out loud, everyone's going to have a far better understanding. Right. So what do we need to do to prepare for a controls page turn? It's really important to understand the design and the controls inside and out. So page through those HVAC drawings, look at those schematics, Look through that control submittal, read those sequences, have an understanding of what you're going into because you're working through that to create comments. And a lot of times the comments that you're creating or the questions that you're asking, you sort of know the answer to already, but you really, this is the whole thing about creating awareness to the team when you have all the right people in the room. So we, I know we use that really pretty word regurgitation, but um, that's that whole copy paste thing that we continually see over and over again. And very seldom do designers necessarily want to you know, criticize their own sequence of operation when it's presented back to them, right? So in the end, we just really want to know how is the control contractor really going to get us from A to Z? So they can say they're doing it, but how are they getting there? An example might be discharge air reset. An engineer might call it Sherman respond or something like that. But there's things out there called, you know, critical zone reset, or there might be just a zone temperature that's proportionally, you know, resetting the discharge temperature. You know, someone might say, hey, my outside air reset to a discharge air reset is what I was planning on doing. Again, we just want to hear what the contractor is going to do so that we have an understanding because we're basing what these mm -hmm. words are to actually help write our functional right. tests so that we can match that. Mm -hmm. So we, we happen to use a cloud-based tool. In our case, we're using CX Alloy, but there's many, um, many options out there that folks can use. So we're using a cloud-based tool to create comments. So we, we issue our comments on that. And then we provide them in advance to our meeting 
to the team. So the designer, the control contractor, folks on the team, the owner, you have an opportunity to look at the comments so that they can come to the meeting prepared with responses and we can have a really efficient and effective meeting instead of walking out with, instead of hearing, oh, I'll have to get back to you on that, a lot of times they come with answers. So instead of you know having to have 50 open issues at the end of the day, maybe you have eight. So that's a really nice way to do it. It's a great tracking tool with the history, obviously, so you can everybody is, can see responses live as they go. We use Bluebeam markup tools and whatever to put our comments on. We also send that information because you know it's a good narrative within the CX Alloy platform, but this is actually pointing to where our questions might be, helps them get a better answer and an understanding or whatever. And we pr provide that in that, mm -hmm. that early submission. And being candid, that early submission to the contractors might be only two or three days. Yeah. It's certainly not. Weeks would be wonderful, but that just doesn't often happen. Right. So now we're getting to the, the, the fun part or whatever. So what, is about, we're, what we're about to see, what's behind the curtain or whatever, no, are, <laughs> are just actual submittal pages or whatever that, that we reviewed. I know in the synopsis or whatever we kind of talked about, you know, you guys could all be like, you guys could all be the control contractors you want to defend what's up here or you can take any role. We'll see if there's an opportunity to kind of talk that right. through, but let's just go and see how this first one goes. Right, and feel free to ask anything along the way. So, though it's not easy to see, and we'll be fixing that momentarily or whatever, what are the first usually sets of drawings that are in a control submittal? Are things kind of talking about the network topology, the use of supervisors, how many there might be, routers, that kind of fun stuff as well as even the control and power wiring. So when we see that, it, it develops us and creates a whole list of questions. Right, so number one, I mean, does IT even know that you're going to need to go on their network? So while this might seem obvious in you know, hotels or large facilities that have continuous remodels or building additions, it's not always obvious to every, um, every new building. So just, you're there creating awareness, right? Awareness that, Hey, controls needs to go on your network. The one on how many IP drops are needed. You know, that engineer early on is saying, you know what, customarily, you know, even my basis of design contractor just uses one type of router. This should all fit under that. So I'm just going to provide one IP drop. But then the control contractor that submits, their, their base controllers, and they prefer is, I'm going to take one that everyone that has an Ethernet drop on it, right? So all of a sudden, one IP drop potentially turns to 10. And then they decide to do the integrations or whatever pertaining, you know, with, um, again, you know, BACnet over IP. So there's even more. So that all of a sudden, that this number is starting to add up, which the I people need to know what that is right. but also the low voltage guy needs to go and he usually raise up the flag saying you know my electrical drawing with this one little circle you know says that I have one IP drop and all of a sudden you're giving me 14 so that oftentimes ends up being you know someone writing an RFI and a potential change order and it goes back to what we said originally if you're having these conversations early you might have a better understanding mm -hmm. of how many you might need but it's still a question that should be asked because you want to ask these early right. to help subsequent things momentarily, right? Right. And then awareness, I, I know I keep saying that word, but awareness about making sure that when the construction team, the commissioning team, understands that the network is available, that's when the work really begins. People think, you know, network is oftentimes late, right? Oh, we're going to have it next week, oh, we're going to have it next week, oh, it's going to be next month, and it's just, keep, just keep kind of getting pushed out there. And everybody thinks, okay, when we get the network, everything's great. But really, that's when the work begins. So once you have the network, that's when you can start your integrations, and that's when all the problems start arising. So it's really important to create awareness that, hey, just because we got network you know, two weeks before you want to go live, <laughs> that's when we can actually start our work. And then existing buildings. You know, whether or not it's on the IT side on routers or, or air handling units, how many air handling unit ones can there be on every project? Right, you know this. This remodel's got air handling in one, and yeah. this one's got air handling. You know, so you know, <laughs> kind of working with the contractors or whatever, or the designers to try to, you know, let's get let let's start using proper numbering right off the bat. Right. The use of repeaters, protocols, or whatever are all things again that we we want to go and ask. So then the other portion, you know, the as-built drawings, you know. 
I always think that this is the, the applications engineer's best shot or whatever of thinking how it's going to get wired. During our meeting, we're going to be calling them on it, saying that you know we're going to want to see an as-built topography drawing, and we're going to go and want to break your system by disconnecting you know, the back net system to see that you know we're expecting all of these devices from here on all past to you know to go off and and those type of things and then the other aspect is this specification line right that speaks to yeah, temporary network yeah it's really nice when you can have that conversation up front about providing a temporary network oftentimes it doesn't take too much from a financial aspect when you can use some of the existing runs out in the field and maybe buy a couple of inexpensive switches. Um, providing a temporary network can kind of remove the excuses for not having a network, not being able to start some of the integrations earlier. So you know, I know I was on a project where they kept saying, it'll be here in two days, two days, two days, and literally probably four months went through. But they never put the temporary network in because why would we do that if it's going to be here in two days? Well, then why would we do that if it's going to be here in three days? Well, why would we do that if it's going to be here in a week? And it just kept getting pushed out. But had we known back here that it was really going to be four months, <laughs> They would have done it, but um, it's, it re removes the excuses. It helps control folks be able to start implementing and integrating things earlier and seeing those issues earlier so they don't become such critical items right before final deadlines or even after deadlines. The same thing all holds true for, for power, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. if there are hot water boilers and hot water pumps and there is an emergency generator on the job, and those mm -hmm. are on that. You know, are the controls that are operating those devices also on emergency power? Right. And those are important things to be looking at. Similarly, an air handler. You know, if an air handler is on emergency power and the controls are on UPS or emergency power, what about those life safety dampers? Because per code, if your system is off, all those dampers out in the system need to be closed. And when your emergency power turns your air handler on with your controls, we want to make sure all those dampers open so that air handler is actually useful. And again, another point there that we know that we're going to be looking for that power topography to be right because you know when the project's finished, right, we want to be able to give the owner an accurate document showing the proper wiring, you know, for their as builds. Mm -hmm. So here we have a design build steamed hot water heat exchanger. We've got a one third, two third steam valve situation, entering the heat exchanger, then we've got two pumps in parallel out to a system with a DP sensor for control. And you'll see in this sequence, well maybe you can't see, it's a little small, but if you could, it, uh, you would probably not see any numbers anywhere. So we look at this, it's kind of like a recipe, right? So uh, we can move on. Advance? Yep. There we go. So we so, just kind of come up with comments based on that. So it leads us to ask just a bunch of questions. If they're, if they're going to be putting things out in general, we like asking questions mm -hmm. to be more specific. The, the sequence kind of did talk about turning a, you know, a hot water pump on and off just based on temperature, but we all know from you know, Wisconsin, but probably most places when you have hot water reheat that that does need to run really continuously during the occupied hours or whatever to make up for the, the ventilation and the overcooling. Mm -hmm. So we're going to ask a question. Can we just maybe consider uh, whenever we're occupied, we'll run our pumps continuously, but when we go to unoccupied, but we're maybe above 45 degrees, Let's, let us turn our hot water system completely off and work to save some energy or whatever. But if there's any callers out there for heat, you know, mm -hmm. to let that go. You know, we're still way above freezing, but we can still turn some things off and then limit some run mm -hmm. hours. So here in this particular sequence, they indicated leg pump, which indicates, which implies the multiple pumps. But leg implies also that at some point you'll be running both pumps at the same time. So is there anything that defines how are you going to stage those? How are you going to bring on the leg pump? How are you going to turn it off? And if it truly is not a leg pump and it's truly redundant, then it should be called standby. So having a true understanding of what the true intent is is important. You know, words matter. Right? So it goes to the, to the words matter. Mm -hmm. And this also goes to when we're 
thoroughly scouring the submittal, right? We're yeah. looking at schedules, we're looking at the heat exchange, we're looking at the pump GPMs mm -hmm. or whatever, and we're kind of making that assessment of what we believe the system is right. to kind of give us this antage, you know, is it a lag pump lead mm -hmm. lag system or is it a lead standby right. system? Um, Multi-range transmitters, expected range, um, you know, differential pressure is probably a big one on this because, you know, they can be very, you know, multiple ranging or whatever. Control contractor might think that, hey, my differential pressure set point is, hey, it's going to be 15 pounds or whatever. So I'm going to use this multi-range transmitter and I'm going to set the ceiling at 25 pounds. Unbeknownst to maybe them is that the DP transmitter that they provided were ones with the two single differential pressure transmitters in it, and it's actually doing the math to create the differential mm -hmm. pressure. Mm -hmm. But the pump head, right, was like 50 PSI. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, that top number just clips and then completely messes up the, you know, the differential pressure reading and they actually oversped the pumps. But, so having those type of conversations about, you know, believing the, the, to set up the appropriate ranges are, again, a worthy question mm -hmm. if, if they're not identifying that. And then little goofy little things, right? They, they, they showed a condensate pump and they actually showed a command on a condensate pump and virtually all condensate pumps are operated off of a float, you know, Building automation sometimes monitors their high level or just their run status by the, the, on the motor, but at the same time, um, we didn't think a command was necessary, so we would ask that to come off. Right. I thought I clicked. <laughs> Um, being from Wisconsin, maybe we look at this a little bit more, but um, noting the fail position of valves and pumps. So in our case, you know, we'd probably fail a one-third valve open, depending on situations, or a valve might fail open. It depends on what type of situation we're in. But reflecting that on the drawings, and, and because every once in a while you run into those situations, you know, if we go to like a generator room with a smoke damper in the wall, you know, failing that smoke damper open versus closed. So you just want to make sure that you are, you have your fail opens and fail closes appropriate. So our, our quick summary or whatever is that we're wanting to have the contractor provide us some details and, and we're going to, so we can write our sequence of operation around it and then, and then it's actually going to be put into their, you know, their as-built mm -hmm. um, drawings. Um, what other ones do we have on there? I'll skip. Yep. So here we have <laughs> a hot water system. We've got two boilers, a variable prime system. Two boilers, we've got, again, parallel pumps that pump out to the system. We do have a bypass valve and DP sensor out in the system. One thing nice to note on this particular submittal is you can see that the control contractor chose to put in the um, manufacturer supplied devices into their submittal, which is really nice because they're acknowledging that they're there and it doesn't look like parts and pieces are missing. So it's kind of a real record document. And they're also um, including some of that wiring uh, information that will help their installer. On this sequence of operation, it kind of made us smile about the different project. I mean, the engineer on this one took better, more time or whatever to actually determine what actual set points were when things were going to be enabled, disabled, explain what they wanted the hot water reset schedule to be. You know, granted, it's you know adjustable. You know, things that we would ask on set points or whatever to the building automation contractor is, you know, you're going to make this reset schedule, you know, visible, right, to allow someone to change it and not kind of just buried in code that nobody can. Right. You know, those are some of these little intangible mm -hmm. things that we speak to. Um, and then, so that was a good thing. And now pertaining to like minimum flow and its location, you know, we had, from our experiences, so many times we were seeing the minimum flow valve actually like located right in the boiler room. And that's kind of given us more problems of creating short cycling mm -hmm. because when it's in bypass, it's just sending that hot water right back to the boiler and kind of promotes again a short cycling situation. Right. So this is again even an opportunity, not just with control wise, to kind of maybe get into a little more technical stuff mm -hmm. of on design saying, you know, can we be considering, you know, these minimum flow valve you know, further out in the system? Or can we right. even consider potentially the good old-fashioned three-way valves that are out in the system 
that just really provide more volume and equal temperature just out to the whole system. Just a couple, maybe on some cab heaters or something that are out there. Yeah. But you know, speaking of minimum flow, you know, a lot of times you have two, three, four boilers on a system, and how do they like to operate most efficiently? <laughs> they all like to run together, right? So oftentimes you find that their most efficient way is to operate at minimum together. And what that means, instead of having 50 GPM of minimum flow for one boiler, you now have 50 times four, so you have 200 GPM of minimum, minimum flow. So unless you switch the switch, flip the switch in the boiler to change it to like capacity mode or something, where you run one to capacity, then bring on the second, and then the third and fourth, you have to make sure, make sure that your system is ready to accommodate the minimum flow times the quantity of boilers. The, the boiler um, emergency shutoff switch, you know, code actually indicates that that should be located directly outside of the boiler room door, but mm -hmm. if it's a public thoroughfare or whatever, you know, we would say, you know, code also says you can take an exception, if approving the by the AHK, okay. you know, to locate it on the inside. So if we're seeing it on the outside, it's just something that we're going to proactively ask that question versus you know, getting a call on some winter day saying, you know, someone accidentally hit the bump yeah. and I had no hot water, right? Right, and that has to be at every door that's exiting the boiler room. So um, if the controls fail, do we fail the pumps on? So basically, you know, those are the sorts of questions that you're asking. That kind of goes back to the first screen. But we like to see the wiring um, that they showed with both their own stuff and with the factory provided devices. So it's good to, it, this was a good example of them kind of showing some of that information. Using the proper wording, standby what, versus. Uh, what, and it was properly yep. used here, right? Yep. Um, yes, it was. And then, was and the then, and then the, oh, I'm sorry, and then this is a good place to actually mm -hmm. talk about, you know, pump swapping. You know, is it going to be based on. Runtime. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just a generic runtime of you know 750 hours. Right. Again, up by in Wisconsin, yeah. we get a little nervous about that because with Murphy's Law, that means it's going to happen on New Year's Day at around two in the morning when it's like minus 15 degrees outside, and we're making a decision to flop pumps. You know that right. would be a bad idea. Right. So this is great to leverage then the facilities team, yep. right, and say, hey, when do you guys do this with your existing systems? Or for somebody right. new, we might suggest. You know, how about making sure we do this on a Tuesday? Because, you know, there are a lot of holidays that are on Monday. We'll do it at like 10 o'clock during first shift or whatever, so that this will happen at that time, so that, you know, everybody's there in case something bad does happen, right? right? Then people could by chance react. Right, to and it. that's kind of a good combined, you know, on Tuesdays at 10 o'clock, you can do a runtime equalizer, which just means that the system looks to see which pump has the least runtime and switches that pump to lead at that time versus it just switching when it is X over the maximum run hours of the other pumps. Here we've got a packaged rooftop unit. And in this case, that note number two, which I'll read, I'll read to you. Um, it says, unit sequence of operation to be written and programmed by the equipment manufacturer. Whoa, that's our 1%. <laughs> <laughs> our 1% did not go and copy paste those control sequences from the designer back into their submittal. So that was really excellent. But now it's also important to understand that you can get a, um, a rooftop unit manual that's like this thick with sequence of oper sequences of operation. They might have 10 different ways that they do discharge air temperature control. So we need to talk about and determine what one way are you really going to use? And that paragraph needs to work its way into this record control submittal. So we all want to understand how it's really going to work. So this is an example of why we want the control contractor, the mechanical yes. contractor, and the vendor, mm -hmm. so that, that everyone can kind of decide how this is going to operate. Right. Again, packaged rooftops or whatever are not necessarily overcomplicated units, but we are functionally testing it. We see the sequence. We are going to hold them accountable mm -hmm. to what that sequence indicates, yeah. unless we are kind of told otherwise, and that's yeah. what we would be we doing. We have sometimes start this meeting with, okay, you copied the sequences right back at the engineer, so now we're gonna hold you to them, right? And that's when their eyes get a little bit big, and uh, we have to dive into the details. So the same thing we spoke about, like using Bluebeam, was similar that we used here, or whatever, is that if you are gonna show a schematic, um, it should be shown accurately. 
And there was a number of things that they had wrong. They had the gas heating in the wrong place. They actually had, they showed a return fan, but it was really a powered relief fan. You know, there wasn't an airflow monitoring station and we're saying, you know, how did we determine all this stuff? Well, we, we actually went and reviewed the submittal to find out what all the components were that were actually being provided. And so that kind of gave us a better understanding of how it works. And again, mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a system schematic should be accurate. Now, mm -hmm. I know a lot of controls people say, you know, mine drawing shouldn't be used for that. But it, and I completely agree, but it's unbelievable how many people do look at that control drawing schematic because sometimes that's the best one. You know, sometimes even the designers don't put a good enough schematic and it, it's just a really good picture of how something should right. operate. And here, this is kind of an example of where the designer's words um, do not match the words from the package unit's uh, manual. So there's a big disconnect. So the designer saying, I want this discharge error reset and the package is saying, this is how I do it. And this is an example also on the next slide here, which is, a, I'm using the word ditto there, is that the, con the mechanical engineer is what created this situation and had the control contractor go down a, a bad rabbit hole, right? Because the engineer actually indicated that it was going to be a return fan, you know, controlled from a duct static sensor. And this was on a ducted system, but it didn't have any VAV boxes. It really was a misapplication. And like the submittal indicated, it wasn't even a unit that had a return fan, that was a relief fan. Mm -hmm. So the, the package rooftop had a better definitive sequence of operation, so we then went to utilize that. Right. So this is an example of where the designer is asking in their sequences, hey, we want a low limit, we want a high discharge uh, safety after the supply fan, and we want them to be resettable from the indoor temperature control panel, not at the unit itself. So the equipment vendor didn't indicate any safeties, and the um, control contractor just and, you know, was going under the belief that, hey, the equipment's coming with those things, so neither one of them included it, and it just turned into a little bit of, you know, contention in that meeting. And in, in many cases, those rooftop units do come with a low limit, or they do come with a discharge safety, but in this case, the designer wanted them resettable at the indoor temperature control panel, so, you know, if they're automatic resetting, and then you can put maybe a latching relay in your control panel in the building, then you can manually reset it from inside the building and your and facilities don't have to go up to the roof to do resets. So it's just really important to talk through those situations, see who's wiring it, who's providing it, and how are we gonna get from here to there. And this is oftentimes where we need the owner and even the engineer mm -hmm. to actually push this direction. Because right. the engineer was probably gonna say, you know what, I wrote it down, I just want it done, I really don't care who does it. Right. And it's your point, what you wrote there, you know, people digging in their heels, you know, we have to get it to work. So then we need the owner to pick up the phone and to the engineer right. or, or the general say, get this done. Yeah, and the controls contractors, even though, even when you talk about it in this page turn, they really like to forget about or ignore the resetting from indoor temperature control panel. So you really have to follow through on those items. So even if the unit is gas, there's, Many times, you know, say, why do you need a freeze stand if it's gas and DX? I mean, what are we protecting? Well, we're protecting all the hot water devices that are downstream of the unit. And we've had a number of, I like to say many, but it's not many, but a number of instances where we've had a unit with gas and DX, and we have pushed to have hardwired freeze stats or hardwired low limits installed in the ductwork after the unit. And there is a lot of pushback to us and um, there have been numerous instances where maybe the gas will fail or, or shut off or uh, you just have some sort of failure event. And one case was middle of winter, a nice freezing day, loss of communication. I think they put in a software low limit and they froze coils all over and caused a ton of damage. And then of course, in come the lawyers who like to wrap their arms around the entire team, right? So um, in, in our case, we had fought pretty hard to try and have a hardwired freeze stat put in, so we are pretty safe on that. We, but, had docu uh, <laughs> we had documentation. We have some really good documentation on that one. But, um, but it's, you know, we've just experienced it, gosh, at least three or four times over 
many, five many to years. seven years. And it's just, it happens. And unfortunately, at Murphy's Law, like Dave mentioned. It's never with the same owner because when it happens to an owner, then it doesn't. Then they start putting free stats. <laughs> Um, it, it's very important of our, you know, our summary here is really just kind of discussing and getting, you know, removing the, the disconnects. And like we were talking about as our, you know, preamble here, this was a job that, that we got, you know, during construction. So we're just finding it out, you know, at the time we're reviewing it. If these are things during the design phase, we're working hard from a design review perspective to kind of point and identify these items early so we don't have to get into these type of situations later. Right, and obviously inv involving the right people. I know it sounds like we're repeating ourselves, but those are just because it's important points. So making sure you have the equipment vendor, controls, contract, or the right people in the room. So the simple VAV box with reheat, which isn't always as simple as what you might think it is. Right, uh, you know, we've had a control contractor actually say to us that, you know, so often we put like our newest person on a VAV box because it's a simple device, right? But then, hey, if you get one device wrong, you might be making changes on 400. So sometimes it's important to really have these, you know, these talks up front, maybe put your, your good guy, your good person on that. So even with, with what Rachel is indicating is that the, the, the control person that identified that just for, you know, with us or whatever, that's how he kind of runs his mm -hmm. projects. He puts a really smart person on VAV boxes to start with or whatever, so that they make sure that, you know, that things are right and, and properly vetted, mm -hmm. just to eliminate that potential right. 400 mistakes. You know, wiring diagrams or whatever, you know, from vendor to vendor to vendor are pretty, you know, generic, and they, but they do illustrate what, what happens, but the bigger questions on VAV boxes is what happens, you know, within the controller itself. You know, many VAV box controllers from manufacturer to manufacturer almost have pre-built in routines and they actually have like, you know, set points that are typically, might not even be used, but, mm -hmm. and if they're sitting in there, we want to make sure that there's the appropriate value for each. Because just as an example, you know, there's, there's ventilation minimum, heating minimum, you know, maximum cooling, unoccupied minimum, you know, which, should it be zero? Or can it be any number that we want, cooling maximum, right? And then there's, you know, standby minimums, you know, standby maximum. So there's just all these plethora of numbers that we're gonna wanna go and get an understanding of. Right, um, and sometimes they even implement like heating maximums. So just understanding if there's appropriate um, energy recovering the building where they can even use that. Um, there's ambient lockouts on perimeter heat. So I know a lot of times we see 50 or 55, but we've even seen 45 degrees where they decide to lock out their perimeter heat. And then understanding if you do have perimeter, perimeter heat, what's going first? Are you gonna heat with your perimeter heat first and then you reheat? Or are you gonna use them simultaneously? Or are you gonna do vice versa? And then there's a discharge air reheat or discharge air high limit that's on a VAV box, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it might be set at 85, 90 degrees, which is prohibiting that air from getting too hot so that it would just, you know, if it's too hot, it's just gonna stick at the ceiling and not kind of drop down. And, but some control manufacturers, they read that limit and they're thinking it's almost like a target, right? So when it goes into heating, it just boom, goes right to 85 and that's not the premise at all. Right. This is also a good opportunity to have a conversation about the stat. So uh, there are a lot of owners now that are actually not, you know, you can talk about digital display or not. There's a lot of owners that are actually liking the warmer, cooler little sliding scale because you put a number in front of someone and then you start, it like helps you figure out how you should feel <laughs> if you have a number versus just feeling how you feel. But um, there's also those override buttons and you know if it's in a public area versus a private area or an office. So there's all those discussions to have with the owner in the room because sometimes they've not actually been a part of those discussions yet. Um, occupied, unoccupied, so unoccupied, standby. So having an understanding, are, are we talking about unoccupied during occupied hours and we're just going into standby because someone left the room for a while? Or are we talking about unoccupied because the building's unoccupied from a scheduled perspective? Because those can be different extended set points or um, whether it's from a temperature or from an airflow standpoint.
Because one thing that sometimes control contractors do when there's a standby application, right, is that there's potentially a, a morning warm-up sequence or whatever, and it's sitting in standby, and it's not telling the box to go open, and it's, it's not taking advantage of the heating mm -hmm. cycle that might be happening with the, the air handling, with the rooftop or mm -hmm. air handling unit situation. So who provides them? You know, if, if the control contra contractor is going to use an occupancy sensor, oftentimes there's an ox sensor there from the electrician from, for lighting. Uh, do they have a two-pole relay, or is the control contractor putting in their own ox sensor, or it, did, are the, do the lights actually come with the occupancy sensor now? So there's so many different things out there these days. It's good to have an understanding to make sure that if they need to provide their own, that they are indeed doing so. And there's even just the worthiness of use. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes healthcare folks or whatever might have a facility that's going to likely have a very high census or prove mm -hmm. that they do. You know, the rule of like one VAV box to three rooms, mm -hmm. you know, those rooms are like occupied virtually from beginning to end. So the cost of adding occupancy sensors really doesn't give them any value. It's just another thing from a service perspective. Mm -hmm. Just an example of sequences of operation in this instance, um, matching and um, explaining things well. So life safety dampers, um, who controls them? And you know, fire, we used to talk about, uh, we now talk about this at our kickoff meeting or um, in this controls patient, whatever's earlier, because, or even a design review, ideally a design review if that's earlier yet. But so often at the end of projects, we come to the end and controls are saying, well, but fire alarm's controlling those, and fire alarm says controls is controlling those, and then it's a big, big deal at the end because you know wires aren't pulled. And so understanding from the beginning, because fire smoke dampers close for a variety of reasons. One is fire alarm, one is you know maintenance. They shut, shut an air handler down, so then all the dampers need to close on that fan system. And another is a safety. So if the unit trips on a safety, all those fire smoke dampers, smoke dampers need to close because they are no longer, I'm kind of jumping here, sorry, but per code they have to close because they are no longer a, an active fire alarm sensor in most cases. Sensing tubes require a, um, got the 10 minute warning, sensing tubes require a minimum velocity in order to remain functional. And the code says you can leave those dampers open if you have a functional sensing device. So if the fan system is off, you no longer have a functional sensing device because there's no velocity past those sensing tubes. And attached here is our code reference, and people might be laughing, saying, 2015, well, Wisconsin doesn't move very fast. And so we're still operating it's off the 2015 fast. code on top of all sorts of Wisconsinisms on top yes. of that. Lots of Wisconsinisms. So our summary. Um, it's really important that when we're doing these that we as commissioning providers are completely prepared and have a really good understanding of how the system should work, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we should read the sequences and see how the designers are saying how it works, and that's how it should be working, but we should be using our experiences, especially for likely our owners that we are all familiar with, to make sure that it is working the way they are anticipating and it's being worded properly. Right, and in order to provide the best benefit, if you can provide your comments early to the team, that can add a lot of value to the outcome of that particular meeting. The line there that says the control contractor painting themselves in the corner, if they are going to be using the designer's words right at them, you know, we are going to be relentless to make sure that they are using those words like they said they were. So their get out of jail free card is likely at a controls page turn saying, whoa, 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 no, I didn't really mean that. And whoa, 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 I didn't really mean that either. Right. So, so that's again where the conversation is a good thing. And because otherwise people are just flopping words and saying, hey, we're doing it. And until people are calling them on right. it or whatever, then that becomes an issue. Right, we oftentimes see these meetings lasting two to three hours, and if the building is more complex or you have more complex systems, they can be two, three, four meetings. And um, they don't just necessarily apply to controls, you can have a lot of value just doing a fire alarm controls page turn or security.
like everything else with commissioning, right? And we want to be documenting this. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that it is documented. Like we've mentioned, the use of CX Alloy is a great tool for us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's there in the cloud. It's there for everybody to see. It's places that we can go back to reference right. to create closure of those items. Exactly. And once again, awareness. Um, it, that's really your, your place to create awareness so everybody's on the same page in the room. And in this case, um, it's best done in person if possible. The general contractors have all of a sudden the team gotten this, wow, these control page turns are pretty cool. And even though I know nothing about them, I still want to lead them. And we're, we're, we throw the penalty flag and say, no, you know, this is, this is our meeting to run. It's our meeting to invite the, the right people here. We want you to participate, but you know, when, when they potentially see good ideas, they, they want to run with them. And, right. you know, and, and we're not, we're not going to be jerks about it. We're saying, well, if it's your meeting, then it's probably you should, you should be the one being the, telling everyone what to do and creating the minutes, but that's not how it works. Yeah, unfortunately, no, but yeah. Um, and what we call, what we would call our worst control page turn ever, the owner actually called the best. Uh, we kind of walked into this. It was an example of the control contractor copy and pasted and then we all sat in the room together and we walked through and he's like well no i'm not doing that no i'm not doing that and so you know the designers in the room the owners in the room he he was in the room and it was a real eye-opening experience for um the owner for the engineer because we we're just like so we just want to make sure that dave different dave you're okay with this or is this what you're intending so you know we're just kind of trying to mediate and facilitate the process and ask the questions to to get, well, no, I, have, I, I said it's supposed to be this way, and then for the control contractor to actually have to acknowledge that they have to change their intent. So the presentation that's on your phones, because it's already there, there is bonus content or whatever, <laughs> but you know, regarding stratification, coil pumps, more on fire smoke dampers, I believe. So mm -hmm. there's other information out there, but we knew we weren't going to have time we for don't that. Talk fast and to get there. We went maybe just almost a tad long. So if there are any questions, oh, there's multiple. <laughs> I, I don't see a microphone, so you can just yell. <laughs> Hello. Um, so some of these changes are being addressed by the controls contractor through resubmission. But I'm also seeing owners making changes to an undefined flow meter. We don't want insertion, we want ultrasonic. Or there's a sequence of operation that needs to be changed by the engineer. How do you go about getting those significant changes documented aside from commissioning meeting minutes? Are you forcing the architect to issue an ASI or change bulletin? How are you making that part of the contract? I think that um, when you have changes such as that, that is generally um, like a confirming RFI, either written from the control or mechanical contractor to the engineer. And I, it would have to have a pricing point go through the general. But you're right, there are, this meeting can result in change orders. But it's really the opportunity to make sure that, it's, it's the opportunity to acknowledge that stuff early versus later. And if the owner, you know, if there's, if there's some disagreements and things like that, then, then we'll actually say, let's have a side, you guys right. have your sidebar meeting, you know, you, contractor, architect, owner, you guys, you guys go and duke it out. I mean, if the owner's all of a sudden saying, hey, um, I, I want this and it wasn't the original intent, um, you know, there, there's not a contractor out there that's not going to raise their arm right. saying, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Sure. Uh, yeah, well, thanks for the presentation. Good presentation. A uh, couple questions for you. Uh, well, maybe one comment, one question. So one thing I didn't see on there, uh, which I'm sure you guys have run across, is uh, a service mode is what we call it. It's where you actually turn the equipment off to do service. Mm -hmm. And there'll be controls that'll show how they're going to ramp down chillers and how the valves will do. But if you need to go and command it off or literally flip the disconnect switch, what's going to happen? And that's usually an eye opener for many of the engineers and teams we're working with. So if you kind of make sure that you're able to shut it down for service, emergency maintenance, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the question I have for you is when you finish your page turners, have you ever gone through it and then you show up to functionally test and there's still 
not done and they haven't programmed. And if you haven't experienced that, what would you do if that happened after you went through all that work? Yeah, and th this is a good example too of when um, of having the right people in the room for the page turn. Is you know if we have the just the PM in the room for the page turn, it is highly likely that almost no, okay, a significant number be of honest. comments will not be addressed. <laughs> okay, and then we'll be pulling up the well. Look at here. Look at here. All these comments that you guys said you were going to do, and none of this is in place, right? And so um, it ends up ca causing like rework on their part because they have to implement those things um, what helps us also is we provide the documentation we do. We and 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 it doesn't always happen or whatever we could talk about that too but you need a strong owner right and a lot of our owners or whatever and we do a lot of healthcare, and they have oftentimes their dedicated favorite sun control contractor you know sometimes they have to just put up the phone saying dude you know what you guys just have your self-performing contractor, not even any competition. Do me a favor here, right? I mean, and, and do it and do it right. And and it all depends even on the control contractor teams, right? There there's some or whatever that you just have to you know whisper in their ear, ear to do the right thing, That's the you know, before this, and, and they do. But there there's others, you know, when we teased about the line about a, someone writing an RFI to change the set point, a discharge your set point, you know, when someone's going to ask that type of question, you know it's not going to go well. <laughs> right. Yeah, and sometimes they, um, they'll, they'll fight doing some of those items, even though they were discussed with the whole team early on. So sometimes it has to turn into a, an issue that we put on CX Alloy in our case, that we assign to either the control contractor or the engineer to almost re-ask the question and provide the, in the page turn, it was determined that, confirm this is still the intent. Or, and then it can get reassigned back to the control contractor. You know, different things like, there's different things you can do like that. I know we're running almost over an hour, but I think there's one more, do you have a question? I was wondering if you guys were successful in getting this requirement in the specs. Because I could see a, a vendor, right now you have a vendor saying, that wasn't my bad. I'm not going to It's a pay me now, pay me later. You know, I think, I guess I'm just, you know, we, we're pretty good at embarrassing people to come. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, you know, I found, I found that all uh, projects were like that. Uh, I'm still able to get cooperation simply because I think a lot of general contractors, like you said, they realize it's a good idea and they've been burnt on the previous one. So even if it didn't make them respect, you got hopefully someone on the senior level uh, team and they recognize that. They're, you're right, you can kind of embarrass them. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. That's the fun part. No. Okay, no. not. <laughs> All right, let me- Thanks, uh, everybody. Oh, well, there's one me, more question. Yeah, I got one more back here. No um, so uh, for lead purposes and IGCC and everything like that, you know, we have to do the design review and the design review back check. When would you recommend doing this meeting in that process? As soon as that control submittal is available. <laughs> well, you're saying that you're going, he's indicating design, mm -hmm. right? You said during the design, Phase oh. that, during right, right. Oh. when so, lead is saying on the enhanced credit to do a design review, which actually is probably even under the fundamental. Yeah, it's, un thing. it's under fundamental. It's now, under yeah. fundamental. Kind of moved, but but okay. the um, if if there are trade allies, you know, more and more things are IPD process, right? I mean, and you got all these trade allies. That's the perfect thing to get everybody there, not in the big room, but in the meeting room to do that during the design phase. Right. And, and get people. everyone to talk about this mm -hmm. because if we, we we haven't done near as many in the design as we didn't want because many jobs are competitive bid, but we, we've gotten into in front of the designers and we've done a little bit better yeah. on that. But it's it's a place for improvement. And so that I guess that's where I'm gonna go. Yeah. Everything's always uh, you know, we're always learning something. Absolutely, every day. But um, if you can the earlier you can review those sequences, the better. So if it's early in the design phase, that's great. It's just the sequences at that point. So you still have to, when the control submittal comes through, it doesn't remove the, the need for reviewing the control submittal and seeing the schematics and the parts and pieces that they have in place.
It just shouldn't have as many red squares on it. It should be it. far or, smaller of issues, but <laughs> or you never know. Yep. All right, cool. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>